God is always happy when his saints come together to assemble in his name, in the name of his son, to worship him, glorify him. That's why we're here tonight. And you know, in just a very few minutes, in fact, about six and a half, seven minutes from now, Super Bowl 56 will kick off at the City of Champions Stadium in Inglewood, California, as the Cincinnati Bengals face off against the Los Angeles Rams. And although some 70,000 spectators will be watching from the stadium tonight, an estimated 117 million people will be watching across the country and in some other countries on the television. 117 million. Now, as impressive as that sounds, back in, and I think it was 2012, Austin Jones <laughs> informed me that such figures, as impressive as they may seem, pale in comparison to those of the World Cup final, of course, in soccer. And he was right. I looked up just some figures. And then 2018 World Cup final between France and Croatia, 517 million people watched that final, the entire match, with over... A billion people turning in from time to time. And I don't know why they call that the, the uh, World Cup. They should call that the Quantum Cup. Well, we're turning to our dinky little Super Bowl, all right? <laughs> the ticket price has always surprised me. The lowest price tickets you could get for this year's Super Bowl, including the fees you had to pay, which are a big chunk of money, would be $4,200, $4,200 for the cheapest seats. The better tickets average $18,000 per seat. The best seats in the house would set you back $53,000 for a single seat to watch that game. But if you're like me, looking for a bargain, you'd rent a deluxe suite that would accommodate up to 24 people at the bargain price of $300,000. Well, that's only 12500 per person for some real good seats, high up, yes, but some good seats anyway. But you know, I always think of contrasting those prices with the tickets for the first Super Bowl in 1967 with an average ticket price of $6. $6. And even that was too expensive for a lot of people because 30,000 tickets for that first Super Bowl remain unsold. Anybody, by the way, know who played in that first Super Bowl? Anybody? Historians? Who? Green Bay, Green Bay Packers versus? Chiefs. Kansas City. Wow, Larry, man, you are a resource person tonight. Did you? Wow. Well, they played at L.A. Memorial Coliseum. Green Bay, by the way, won with a score of 35 to 10 in that first Super Bowl. Now, I realize that sporting events may not seem to be appropriate material for sermons. But did you know the New Testament contains many, many references to the sports arena, as it were? In fact, tonight, for our study tonight, and I was kind of torn. I wanted to continue our series on the parable of talents, but not knowing what the weather was going to bring today and how many of you would be able to return, I decided, well, in fact, spent most of the afternoon in my office developing a lesson on Scripture. This is not all the Scriptures, but seven Scriptures in the New Testament to talk about athletics, and I'd like us to go through those quickly because what an application Paul makes as he compares the Christian life with athletic events. So first of all, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'll begin reading at verse 24. And when Paul wrote the church in Corinth, they were very familiar with the athletic games. They hosted the Ith Isthmian games every two years, which would be very similar to the Olympics taking place now, of course, in China, except most of their Olympics were summer Olympics, not the winter type that are hosted uh, in the world today. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race, and obviously the Corinthians were very familiar with those things, all run, but one receives the prize, that's a victory crown made up of these special leaves. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And the crown he's talking about, that we want to obtain, is the crown of righteousness, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize, and again he's comparing this to earthly athletics, but the spiritual application is obvious, is temperate in all things. In other words, the athlete, before the big athletic event, is very careful about his habits, 
his lifestyle. He's very, very sensible. After all, he is in training. What Paul is trying to say is we are in perpetual training for our race. Now they do it, he says, to obtain a perishable crown. I mean, it looks good for a while, but it just withers out and gets old and uh, just kind of vanishes. But we, for an imperishable crown, we're talking about the crown of life, James 1, verse 12. Verse 26, therefore, I run thus. And he's hoping that other Christians in Corinth, such as we today, also would follow his example. I run thus, not with uncertainty. The Greek word means to be confused. Many years ago, and it may happen today, but far more commonly many years ago, some races were lost by runners that were intoxicated, that decided to drink before they ran the races. And they would run, you could just tell, they never ran very, very straight, all right? Thus he says, I fight. That term, interestingly enough, was frequently used in gladiatorial games. They fought battles, these gladiators. I fight not as one who beats the air, whether with my fist or, or like a gladiator with a sword, just, just shadow boxing, as it were. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. In other words, I keep fighting according to the rules of God. We'll talk about those more in just a moment. You know, talk about keeping himself in shape spiritually, making the parallel. Many prize fights have been lost due to lack of conditioning where fighters would just assume they were in really good shape. And they might go for four, five, six rounds, even dominate. But after that, they just tire out and many of them are knocked out because of their lack of discipline in their training. And that's what Paul talks about. We cannot be undisciplined in our spiritual training, folks. We have to keep it up. We really do. That's why I'm glad we come back on Sunday nights and we come on Wednesday nights. And that should not be all of our training, but folks, that's a great foundation for us to continue to train in our homes when we study and we pray, and then we go out and live every day the Christian life. All right, let's go to our next passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll go to the 15th chapter. Verses 57 and 58. And Paul uses one word here, which was very commonly used in the city of Corinth, referring to the athletic, constant athletic events. Paul said, but thanks be to God who gives us the, and that's the word, victory. Victory was the thing that so many Corinthians would strive for in the games. But we do so for much greater victory. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, and this is almost compared again to the athletic events, be steadfast. Don't give up. Don't give out. Immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, you're striving to serve the Lord, and what you do is not in vain in the Lord. The victory comes to those who continue. Let's look now at the book of Philippians. Philippians, the third chapter. I'm really going to focus on verse 12 and 13, but I really need to start the reading at verse 8. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 8. Yet, Paul wrote, indeed, I count all things loss. Now, by all things, he's referring to things in his former life before he came to Christ that were so important to him. His great Jewish heritage, the accomplishment that he, he, he had attained, the, the trophies he'd gathered up in his life for serving God, for being a, a, a wonderful Jew and a wonderful Roman citizen as well. He said, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In other words, they don't mean anything to me anymore. At one time, they were the thing that that's what I live for. But no more. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, which is what we're baptized. We're baptized into Christ, by the way. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, and faith in the Bible always refers to an active, genuine faith, a working faith, a living faith, an active faith, 
not a dead faith, according to James, that doesn't do anything, that I may know him. I love this thought. When he says know him, that means to be intimately familiar with Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul said, I want to experience that, as we'll see. And the fellowship of his sufferings. What, you know what Paul is saying? If I could suffer like Jesus did, my Savior did, I mean, if I had to be beaten and scourged and crucified, if I could just identify with Jesus in that way, Paul said, I just want to know everything about this man and everything he endured, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may obtain to the resurrection of the dead, as Jesus rose from the grave, I want to rise too. But the resurrection of life is what he's wanting. Then verse 12. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. I haven't arrived spiritually, as some might say. And this is used the first racing term, but I press on. I press on. That's the idea of the runner who just continually leans forward. And when he gets close to that line, he doesn't slow up a bit. He just leans toward to break that tape first. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Laid hold of is also an elect, uh, believe it or not, athletic term. Have you ever heard of a relay race? Sure. What do they use in relay races? That they pass between runner to runner? Batons, right? The biggest mistake that can happen is during the handoff of one baton to the other runner of the baton, if they should drop it. Or sometimes, and I saw this at Adrian at a track meet once, <coughs> one runner and the last one to go around, I think it was a mile relay, And he got to running, and somehow he clipped his thigh with that baton, and it came loose. And again, you can't finish without that baton in hand. And he had to go back. I mean, it just flipped, flipped, and he had to roll. Of course, he was in the lead. He finished last. He let go of that. Paul says, I don't want to let go of Jesus Christ no matter what, because I know he won't let go of me. I'm going to continue on. All right, where, where are we at here? Somebody remind me of that verse. But what? 13. 13, thank you. All right. Um, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, and this is important too. Listen, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul had a lot of things behind him to regret, but he had to just let them go. I don't know the number of races. I'm not just talking about high school or even college races. I mean Olympic races that have been lost due to the lead runner just before the finish line looking back, just taking that last look. It always slows you down. It's almost imperceptible that it's, uh, and, and races have lost races because they just turn back almost like, what, who was it, Lot's wife? Look back. It's Sodom, Genesis 19. So forgetting those things which are behind and reaching again forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal. I just don't stop for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, he's talking to all of us too, as many as are mature have this mind. That mind is just continuing on, pressing forward all the time, never looking back. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the decree that we have already attained, in other words, the progress that we've made, let us walk by the same rule. Keep walking on. And we'll talk again about that rule in just a moment. Let us be of the same mind. All right. Now let's turn our Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we'll go to 2 Timothy in a minute. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. And the parallel to athletic events is very, very obvious here. It'll be more so when we get to 2 Timothy 2. Paul says, for bodily exercise, bodily exercise, the Greek term there does, does mean exercise, working out, but was term, a term often employed to denote training for an athletic contest. These guys would get their exercise, right? For bodily exercise profits a little, and even us working out, I mean, it helps some. But godliness, training to be more like God, that's what godliness is, is profitable for all things. Everything in your life, being more like God will help you. 
for all things, having promise of the life that now is. It helps us here. And of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Spiritual exercise. To be more like God every day. Now let's go to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll start at verse 1. And Paul talks about several things. He compares the Christian life to several things, but he's going to get athletics in there. You'll see. Starting at verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's our choice, how strong we are in Christ. We keep working out. We keep training. We keep racing. Avoid looking back. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Teach others what you know so they can teach and live, by the way. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. That's a comparison there to the military. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Just wouldn't work. (laughs) That he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier when you... Enlist to be a soldier, I mean, for a while, while you're in active service, that's going to be your priority. You know, there'll be times, yes, you can take leave, but when you're on duty, I mean, that's it. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. He may be the best athlete out there, but if he breaks the rules... He's not going to win. And a lot of people, a lot of athletes have been disqualified. A lot of runners have been disqualified for getting out of their lane when they weren't allowed to or bumping into somebody intentionally. Sometimes they get away with it. Sometimes they don't. Today, by the way, do you know the biggest reason people are disqualified in races? They failed a drug test. How sad is that? But they're disqualified. They break the rules. They don't win. Well, folks, our rule maker is God. And we have one rule book, his word, all scripture. Paul would also tell Timothy, chapter 3, 16, 17, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. As we continue working toward heaven. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 now. Just two more. Hebrews chapter 12. By the way, Becky and John, it's so good to have you all. And we're going to really pray for your safe trip back tonight. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 12, I'll start at verse 1. And I love this. Most of you, this is, a lot of us really love this. These words by Paul. Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, almost like spectators watching others now race, people who finish their races. And you know, if you ever go to these big track meets, sometimes they have two or three events going on at the same time. But once a certain people on the track team finish, what do they do? They go and watch and applaud the others on their team who are currently racing. This is almost the idea there. Let us lay aside every weight that be anything that would slow or impede our progress forward. Did you know that sprinters, world-class sprinters, wear shoes that weigh less than six ounces? It's incredible. They don't want any more weight. That's why a lot of them cut their hair, shave their heads, and do other things, just to cut that weight down, anything that would slow them down a fraction of a second. They don't want. And... Uh, Um, spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, the application would be anything that would slow us down. Sometimes, obvious things, possessions can slow us down, distract us, right? Or outside responsibilities, or even our hobbies that we love sometimes. I have to be careful of that. There are some things I love to do, and I have to think, okay, if I'm not using this for Jesus Christ, what's the use? Well, we continue. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, I mean, that just lays a trap for us. We just fall down. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The race toward heaven. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Folks, he not only is the author of our faith, he ran that race before we did. 
and he finished. And he left a trail for us to run behind him. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Most of you, if you've ever raced before, competitively, you know that the chief objective, especially in a sprint, well, any race, I suppose, the chief objective, when you get around that final turn, you keep your eyes on one small point straight ahead by that finish line. You never take your eyes off that one point because what you look at is where you go. You just keep running straight for that point. It's the people who get a little distracted, who look a little to the side or turn back, who slow down. We can't afford to do that. The devil is trying to get us to do that all the time, right? He's trying to put things in our path. He's trying to put things beside us. We're trying to say, hey, look at that! <laughs> we can't afford to do that. It's tempting. But with God's help, we can keep our eyes going straight. All right, let's look at one more passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. And I'll start at verse 6. I know we're backing up a little in the Bible, but that's fine. This is a great one to finish with. Finish, yeah. Wow. We're just athletics all over here. And so many of you are athletes. I'd hate to play basketball against Don Jones. If this man really wanted to, he could dribble his way around me with his eyes closed. I would hate to sprint against Austin. You know, Austin could beat me running backwards. I'm not kidding you. All right, let's go. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 6. Paul had reached near the end of his own race. He said, I am already poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. In other words, Paul said, I've run according to the rules. And what's ahead of me, I've never let it out of my sight. I've kept that. Jesus Christ. Finally, there is laid up for me, not just this perishable crown made of leaves, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Oh, what a day that will be when we receive that crown of life and follow Jesus straight into heaven. I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl tonight. I just pray for the souls of the players and all the spectators and people across the nation who need Jesus Christ far more than they need a Super Bowl ring or to win some wager or whatever it is. But I do know that with God's help and our persistence, we will win the greatest prize of all, the crown of life in heaven. Let's pray together. Wonderful Father in heaven, thank you again for everyone who's come out tonight. And thank you for this opportunity to take a good look at some of the scriptures in the New Testament and with which the, the, uh, the uh, subject of athletics is brought in as a comparison to the spiritual life and the things we need to do spiritually. And of course, many of those that Paul wrote directly to were very, very conversant and familiar with those subjects, especially in terms of the athletic races, as well as the gladiatorial matches and other things. Well, help us, Father, to apply these things, to keep our eyes forward, looking at Jesus Christ, and keeping running according to the rules of your word, living by it every day, studying it to remind ourselves of those rules because it's easy to forget, as a lot of athletes today seem to do and are disqualified. Help us, Father, to stay faithful no matter what and to know that we're not alone in this race, that we run together, that we have a family running around us and help us to encourage one another every time we meet together to stay faithful, to hang in that race, to not look back, not be distracted. And Father, at those times, the devil may trip us up, and he has. Help us to get right back up and continue this race, which with your help we will finish as the Apostle Paul. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's through his great name we pray. Amen. I don't know if there's anybody who needs to respond to the invitation tonight, but if there's anybody who's not a Christian who needs to confess your faith in Jesus, 
Repent of your sins. Confess His name. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I mean immersed in water as a believing adult. You can do that tonight. We'd be happy to help you. If you need our prayers tonight, for any reason, any spiritual reason, any reason, if you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. You have to let us know, though. And you can do that tonight by coming up and having a seat. If you need to respond, would you do so? Come up as we stand and sing this song together.